Hi guys, my name is Ketan. Uh, I lead the flight team at Lyft. And first of all, thank you for being here. I know it's late and the last, you know, the last sessions are always the fun ones. Uh, but uh, I, I promise you, you'll have uh, a lot of stuff to look forward. Uh, let's go through the agenda. Um, we will start off uh, with why we build flight. I think many people have that question and like we hear that all the time. Uh, and how did we even conceive about it, uh, of it? Uh, then we'll go through the goals uh, of the system. Um, like like any, any system that we think uh, should look like flight probably have, need, you have these kind of goals. Uh, and then we'll introduce uh, flight itself um, in, you know, like along with the concepts, a, a brief overview of the architecture and uh, the various features that it has, offers. Uh, and the most important thing after that, we'll do a demo. Uh, the brave soul here, Heta, my colleague, will do the demo. Um, uh, and it's gonna be a live demo, hopefully, if everything goes well. Yeah. Uh, and we'll conclude uh, with uh, just like uh, the remaining, we'll try to get through the remaining slides if we can. Um, so we have a lot of content. I, uh, I would like if we go through the entire session and we keep the questions to the end, uh, I promise you we'll hang out uh, here and the entire flight team is here, big shout out. Uh, so uh, they should uh, be hanging around and answering any questions that you have and we can dive as much deeper as you want after the session. Thank you. Uh, so um, <clears throat> I think uh, uh, the, uh, this flight started about in, in 2016, end of 2016, early 2017. And uh, I, I was leading a product uh, machine learning uh, pipelines team. And uh, at that point, uh, Lyft's infrastructure was not the best. We had Envoy, uh, so a yeah, huge shout out, like services were great, but anything that is stateful and would run uh, constantly for a long time would not really work very well. So we hacked around, we did some stuff, and we got things running, and uh, uh, it was fine. But uh, usually, uh, when the company is moving so fast, we would, we would have to deliver new models every quarter all the time and retrain. And the biggest lead time usually was the, was the infrastructure. The infrastructure would just take so much time that uh, many times you would slip on our deliverables. And uh, as a lead, that became a big problem, right? Like I had to answer uh, many times the question. Uh, the other problem was, and this is actually an anecdote that I was just, just telling uh, somebody uh, here, is that one of the data scientists built a cool model uh, in my team and he left the company. And we just weren't able to rebuild that model uh, because I think the model one is, was on his laptop. It was not even checked in anywhere. And we were like, uh, how do we do this again? And at that point, we resolved that this should never happen, right? Uh, we should have a way to share models between, uh, and a good working, uh, like a GitOps or some sort of MLOps that we call nowadays between uh, machine learning engineers and software engineers and the people who manage the pipelines and the people who write the models many times. Um, so overall also, the other thing that we realized is that data and machine learning are arbitrarily separated today in the world. And I, and I actually do not understand why, because most of the times to build a machine learning model, you have to uh, have data. Uh, and if your data systems are not as good as the machine learning uh, frameworks, then you will not be able to build great models. So we wanted to build one platform that manages both data and machine learning for Lyft, and specifically from a compute standpoint at that point. Um, and so uh, that's where flight comes in. But another point that we realized is that machine learning models, like. It's very buzz, buzzwordy today. When we talk about machine learning models, everybody's like, oh, XG, XGBoost or TensorFlow and PyTorch. And those are amazing frameworks to write uh, models right in. Um, and, and they're very important and they do a great job, but that's not it. You have like a lot of things that you need to do just to make the models work in production. Like they need to be repeatable. They need to be run durably. You need to store the data. There needs to be some audit that needs to happen, right? And, and if you just get a model built by a research scientist and thrown over the wall, you incur a lot of technical debt. And so we wanted to uh, somehow reduce that debt and get into a more of a, uh, the things that we have learned in software engineering across so many years of how to build 
uh, really reliable, scalable, and, uh, uh, and, and a proper you know, model to actually deliver consistent quality software. We have actually forgotten that when we are doing machine learning. Uh, so we were like, how do we get that back? So uh, at that point, we, uh, we like about in 2017, uh, um, I want to say somewhere around May, we got our first workflow uh, running on flight. And uh, <clears throat> uh, this diagram basically shows a bunch of uh, use cases at Lyft. Uh, and actually, if you look at them, they are ranging in wide variety. Uh, it's not a comprehensive diagram. It's only like a view, let's say, like uh, it's zoomed in into some part of it. Uh, so we, we do computations of estimated time of arrival, uh, which actually feeds from the map that we generate. And that feeds from actually cars that are driving around and capturing video. And then that feeds into an AV simulation framework. And it builds AV maps. And, and then uh, all of this gets somehow builds like ETL data and so on, right? It's lots and lots of these things. So there are these complex data transformations that are happening within the company, and many of them are actually building machine learning models. But machine learning models, uh, 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 this is actually a simplification. Each of these boxes, in turn, have as many complex interactions as I've shown in, in the slide. So, uh, so to get uh, uh, to build uh, these models, actually, uh, many times, one of the boxes just builds the data set, while the next box builds the model on it. So these complex interactions, uh, uh, is what define Lyft in the back. And amazingly, just a, uh, uh, just a point here, all of these interactions today at Lyft are powered by flight in some way or the other. Um, uh, like, for example, we, are, we have about 3,500 and more unique workflows running on flight, uh, more than millions of containers, 10 million containers per month, uh, and, and it's just growing every day. So uh, <clears throat> with that, we, uh, as we were working with all of these teams, uh, we went through a couple iterations of flight, literally like in the last two and a half years. And now what you see is the actual second iteration of flight. Uh, and while working, we decided to come up with some tenets of what flight wants to be. And uh, in those tenets, like two of the most important ones that we wanted to focus on is that everybody wants orchestration of ML and data pipelines. So that needs to be done really, really well. And the second one is we wanted to make it really easy to collaborate, reuse, and, and perform ML ops. And that's how uh, we come to flight. So what, what, does, what are our goals with flight? Like we wanted flight to be a hosted, scalable, and a serverless orchestration platform. Uh, very buzzwordy, and we'll talk about what serverless here really means. We wanted it to be uh, the fabric that connects multiple compute frameworks. There are lots of compute frameworks out there that do a fantastic job. Many cases, Hive's great for doing queries, and the other cases, Spark's great for doing uh, data processing in memory. Or in other cases, you probably don't want to use either. You want to run like a distributed uh, TensorFlow uh, computation. And then we also wanted it to be extensible, observable. Uh, both of these things are because we learned over a period, like observability is just so that we can keep it running all the time, keep the lights on. And uh, extensibility is because, yes, to, tomorrow something new comes about, you want to quickly adapt to it and uh, let the company evolve and use that uh, as soon as possible. Uh, but we also did not want to reinvent the wheel. So if there is something out there that is great and amazing, let's integrate that into the platform. And then let's make that easy. Um, and while doing all of this, uh, remember, we lost the model once when the engineer left the company. We didn't want that to happen again. So it should be auditable, repeatable, and, and secure. So to, in, to continue with the introduction, we have to first understand a couple concepts in flight. The first concept is a task. A task is the, uh, the smallest or the most indivisible part of the system. Uh, it's, it's an atomic unit of execution, essentially, from our point of view. In the simplest case, it could be a container. In the most complex case, it could be a distributed uh, Spark execution. So it's an entire cluster with the execution and uh, with the driver and the executors. Or it could also be a query that's running on a remote uh, hosted YARN cluster. Um, and <clears throat> uh, one of the defining characteristics of a, a task is the interface. A task is like a function, a pure function in many cases, which takes in a bunch of input data, transforms it, and produces an output. Um, and uh, 
and and having having uh, a strongly typed interface gives you lots of advantages as we'll see in the future. But on the right hand side, I'm shown a couple examples. Uh, one on the right shows like it's a Spark task, uh, and it's showing how this is our Python SDK. We, so flight comes with a Python flight kit uh, uh, model so that you can easily write workflows and and task definitions. Uh, so on the right, uh, one of the first one is a Spark task. Uh, it has a Spark configuration. That's how the users say that I want 10 Spark executors or uh, X size driver, and it automatically creates a cluster and runs it uh, automa magically. And the second example is running an arbitrary container, which could, which could be an arbitrary command, uh, which has a bunch of data as input and produces some output. Once you have these tasks, you can string them along together into a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, and we call them as workflows. Uh, workflows are also uh, strongly typed. They have an interface, they have inputs, they produce outputs, but they are purely in specification. What tasks are in specification with a container, but workflows are also purely in specification. And both of these are specified using protobufs. Uh, and we'll go into more details in, uh, when we demo this. They are versioned explicitly, and uh, they, are, they are declarative using protobufs. Uh, one of the other interesting things, if you're aware of many other workflow frameworks, is the scheduling is very coupled to the actual workflow. Uh, in flight, they are dis disparate entities. A workflow is created, and it's, it's recorded and stored in the inventory system. A schedule is just a, a trigger with an input of the time at which it was triggered. Uh, so that makes it really simple to do backfills or uh, execute large old uh, runs, or any run an older one with a new input time easily. Uh, moreover, uh, as I said, we want it to be serverless for the users. Uh, what does serverless really mean? We wanted them to like not even think about machines at all. So on the right hand side, we, as an example, that says it's a Python code. I want a GPU and I want a CPU, and uh, and uh, I want a timeout of 30 seconds for this function to run and I want five retries on it, or three retries, I guess. Uh, that's how you specify, and this code just gets uh, taken over and runs in the system. So from the user point of view, it's purely serverless. Uh, you only worry about the business logic, and you write the code, and you uh, version it, and it runs. But to make it truly serverless, it needs to be multi-tenant, and the multi-tenancy sh should not be obvious to the user. For example, what that means is I go and I'm running this huge workload. Somebody else comes along and runs this big workload. He should not get affected by this one person. And that's, that was a big problem initially when we started off, like noisy neighbors. And I know there's a big SIG in Kubernetes for multi-tenancy. Um, so we've, uh, we have been working on this uh, quite a bit within flight. The other portion is uh, we wanted, like, uh, because we were extensible, we wanted to allow users to use services that are not within Kubernetes. So like hosted services, if they are the best at what they do. Uh, but these services oftentimes have resource limits in some cases. And how do you enforce those resource limits? So flight comes with a resource pooling and a resource limiting system, even for these external services. Because in Kubernetes, we have quotas, but we don't have those things for things that are outside of Kubernetes. Oops. Did we go over? Okay. Um, so to achieve this, um, uh, it's the, the, the serverless portion is just powered by Kubernetes. Um, Flight is essentially a, a cloud-native architecture. It's simply divided into three parts. So there's a user plane. We'll talk about it in a little bit. There's a control plane, and there's a data plane. The data plane is essentially Kubernetes and a bunch of operators that work together to make the, the magic happen. Uh, and the control plane is the, the admin service, so it's a, it's a REST gRPC service uh, which, uh, with, with the console. Uh, the console is a UI console we'll see in the demo. On the user plane, uh, we have a bunch of libraries because we have a REST gRPC service, we generate a bunch of clients, but we give a first class client for Python and uh, we also provide a flight kit, which is the programming model to write workflows and, uh, and, uh, and DAGs and tasks, uh, all of that in, in Python. But uh, most of you guys, if you look at this uh, architecture, is a, it, it's a single Kubernetes cluster and it works beautifully up to a scale. 
Uh, but sorry, I had a timer check. <laughs> so, but it works beautifully up to a scale, but at Lyft, we quickly ran over that scale. So we had to innovate. And the way, because of the architecture, we could easily split out the data, uh, the, the data layer uh, into multiple Kubernetes clusters. Uh, the good part is that now that flight is open source, it comes out of the, uh, like, multi-cluster support comes out of the box. And also, we don't have much time to go over the architecture, so I'm going to continue with that. Uh, we'll talk more in details afterwards. Um, to make it truly multi-tenant, we had to introduce two other concepts. One concept is uh, projects. So projects are a logical grouping primitive in the system. They allow you to group um, workflows and tasks into a project. And this is like, think about it like a team or a, a project that you're doing within the company. Um, could be an experiment, for example. Uh, and the other concept is domains. Domains are, uh, especially at Lyft, we offer domains, and these are system configured. We offer domains like services, uh, think of like development, staging, and production. It's used to provide CI, CD like semantics to the workflows. Um, and we'll demo some of it in the demo. The projects and domains also help in sharing uh, and are, uh, are, are used for billing, right? Like we, uh, I think there was a talk yesterday about InfraSpend. We are essentially using InfraSpend to uh, show the, the, the cost uh, used by one project and so that the owners of that project know like how much they're spending on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, and so on. As we talked about sharing, uh, here's an example of sharing. On the left-hand side, uh, we have uh, project A that declares a pipeline A, and it also declares a task called my model. On the right-hand side, we have a, a, a pipeline uh, in project B. The person, the user, uh, does not want to write pipeline A and my model again. So you can just simply, uh, as if it's a you know, code dependency, you can put a dependency on, uh, on a version of the pipeline A and the my model, and it dynamically gets pulled in into your pipeline, and that pipeline now gets registered and executed. This is uh, sharing, and it comes with flight. Uh, one other concept that we realize is the exp uh, like once you start composing these workflows dynamically or statically, as we saw, uh, what happens uh, during an execution if one of the downstream workflows fail? So let's take an example on the right. Like W1 is a workflow, and W2, W, it's composed of W2 and W3. You execute W1, W2 works fine, but W1 fails because of W3's failure. When you, now what, you go and you fix the bug in task H. Do we, what do we do in this case after we fix the bug? Do we re-trigger W1 and pay the cost of running W2? You don't have to do that with flight because if you have used one, uh, a feature called as caching, it, uh, it generates a unique signature for every execution and caches all the data as it's being generated. So if you re-trigger uh, the workflows, it will know that, hey, I have run this in the past and the data is, uh, you've marked it as caching, that means there are no side effects. So we should be able to just substitute the outputs. Um, and that's part of the uh, data catalog. There's another advantage of doing this. There's a causal dependency graph that we get as the data is generated through the system. Uh, and that's useful in like artifact lineage or even model lineage. Uh, as we were doing this also, uh, I said that we wanted to be absolutely, uh, like keep the lights on for us and for the users. It comes with a, a deep visibility for the users. And here's an example macro that we give to our Lyft uh, users, which generates automatically, and a bunch of uh, alerts are already created for them. Uh, on, here it's showing like how some set of workflows are running and uh, on a cadence, and how many times they're failing, and so on, and, how may, uh, and, and we are expanding more on these macros. Uh, but uh, if you wanted specific alerts in cases, let's say the workflow fails, uh, at some point, so you can uh, just annotate your workflow saying that, hey, I want a patch pager duty notification if this thing goes south. It just sends you a pager duty notification or an email or a Slack alert, and this comes built in. Uh, we, are, uh, we are working, and it's gonna come soon, it's, uh, we are working on a PubSub model so that you can actually listen to all of the events happening on a workflow or a task, 
and then uh, react to them and probably like launch another workflow or do some other uh, ops processes. Um, we have an OAuth 2 model and uh, each execution in flight is actually uh, contains its, like on AWS would use its own IAM role or in uh, native Kubernetes would use an RBAC service account. Uh, the last bit that I wanted to cover, and it's about almost time. Uh, so uh, flight is extremely extensible. Uh, and uh, we learned this over like, uh, as, we, as we were uh, working with flight, our users wanted to extend the capabilities all the time. So one of the, uh, we, we offer extensibility across the layers. One of the easiest way to extend flight is to go and write everything in flight kit. Uh, it, it's opaque because it's a container from, from flight's point of view, it's executing a container which has flight kit in it, but you can easily extend with Python. Uh, it gives you, like for example, uh, on the right hand side we show sensor tasks like in Airflow or uh, notebook tasks. So these notebook tasks are ex essentially executing a notebook uh, as is with specific inputs and producing outputs uh, without changing the user's notebook. There are problems with this though, that it's opaque from the platform's point of view. So if there are any side effects that are created by this uh, container execution and if the user robots, we might cause a resource leak. And sometimes in our case also, we have caused hundreds of thousands of dollars of resource leaks just because we couldn't clean it up because the user created a side effect. So to solve that problem, uh, flight comes extensible in the back end too. You can actually go and add uh, uh, new capabilities to the flight backend. For example, if you have a new cool operator like the MPI operator, or you have somebody was here was saying that's a Dask operator, uh, you can go and make flight learn how to run Dask or MPI, uh, and that becomes a platform level cap capabilities. And we provide a nice Golang interface to go and implement that. Uh, it's hopefully just writing how to build your CRD, and it works. But what if you wanted to call other external services? We provide a more deeper plugin system to allow you to call any external services like SageMaker, et cetera. And that's it from my end. I'll hand over to Hatem for the demo. Thank you. Is it? Hello? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Wait. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, as Kitten said earlier, I am going to attempt to do a live demo. Uh, and uh, we'll go through the Wi-Fi system that all of you are connected to through VPN all the way to our AWS clusters because, you know, uh, what can possibly go wrong? Um, and with that, I, can you give me a second? I need to uh, enter my password. I don't want to share that on here. Um, just. All right. You don't plug in uh, yes. I am. Hmm. Oh. Sorry. Okay. So for uh, for the demo, uh, let me switch back to the slides here. I was going to. Uh, uh, give you, try to give you a hypothetical example. Um, but then uh, yesterday on our uh, uh, lift to uh, the conference, um, the driver make it all real. Um, so here is the background. Uh, the, the demo is, uh, uh, is about, uh, the, the hypothetical example was, you know, you are driving, you're in a lift car, you get dropped off, you know, and then later on you realize you dropped your, uh, a cell phone or a, your wallet or something like that. Um, but then the driver yesterday was telling us that somebody from this conference, he was dropping off um, and he forgot his passport. Uh, so it made it all real to us. Um, and I want to thank Chang Hong from the flight team uh, for authoring the demo. He had the idea and uh, he worked really hard on it. I hope it works. <laughs> um, 
Uh, but before I get to the demo, uh, we are required to say that Lyft uh, is not and has never used this in any Lyft car, um, so don't worry. Um, um, and uh, yeah, so um, uh, for the demo, um, Cheng Hong recorded a bunch of videos for uh, uh, the back seat of his car. Uh, some of them were empty like this with different lighting conditions. Uh, some would, uh, you know, where you have an item in the back seat. Uh, and we want to build a, a binary classifier that will tell you whether the, there's something in the back seat or there isn't. Um, as with any probably production model uh, you build, you will go through something like this, right? You start on the left side with your raw data, in this case, uh, videos we captured. Uh, you do some pre-processing on them. Um, in our case, we uh, break down the videos into uh, frames, then we uh, um, run some luminance algorithm to pick like the key frames uh, that we want to train on. Um, and then later on, you, you, know, you split your data set into training and testing data set. You run model training, evaluate, and you keep cycling through these until you are satisfied with the performance of your model, and that's what you publish um, as the model. Um, what, we, uh, what we found is in, uh, in a lot of these cases, uh, people want to iterate on each of these steps individually. Um, and in very complex models, maybe, you know, different people will own different parts of that system. Um, and you will maybe want to run the pre-processing as part of like your ingest pipeline. So every time you uh, get a new video recorded, you will run the pre-processing, but not necessarily the entire pipeline. Um, and uh, for that, um, we, uh, Flight offers the, the like you, because flight uh, workflows are composable, you can build a workflow for each part here, use each block essentially in this diagram, uh, and then build like a bigger workflow that can orchestrate the entire pipeline for when you are ready to, you know, make a big run. Um, so let me switch to uh, our favorite ML tool, Jupyter here. Um, and we wrote the, we chose to uh, write the workflow in uh, Jupyter because I hope all, most data scientists are familiar with that. Um, but within Lyft, we do encourage people to uh, um, check in all the, uh, all of their versions of like each iteration of these workflows. Um, but even if you don't, uh, there is, the, the system does keep uh, the registered version uh, immutable. So you cannot edit any versions every time you uh, update your workflow, you register a new version. You can always go back in time uh, to like the good version that ran before. Um, and I'm gonna go through this workflow really quickly. Uh, Flight Kit is our uh, Python SDK. Um, if you are using Python, you will import uh, all the types from Flight Kit. Um, and it is more or less uh, a, a rich uh, SDK, a rich wrapper to our underlying uh, protobuf model for the, the, the spec language where uh, the, the flight uses. Um, then we have the, your uh, class that represents the workflow. Uh, and the, any workflow has basically three sections. Uh, it defines your inputs, and the inputs are uh, strongly typed. We do support primitive types like strings, array of strings and so on, but also more complex types, like the generic type is any JSON serializable object. Um, uh, we also support schemas that are like strongly typed schemas. You can uh, read and write data frames, pentadata data frames. Um, and then this next section comes is uh, your steps, your workflow steps. Uh, this is where you define, uh, where you start calling tasks to you know, perform actions on the inputs. Um, in this case, we are calling uh, another workflow, the data prep workflow. We pass on the raw data, um, and that builds us a node in the graph. We'll see that later when we switch to uh, Flight UI. Uh, the next step comes is the train, uh, and the train consumes the data from some, some inputs from uh, generated by the previous step, some inputs from the workflow, um, run the training algorithm, uh, and then we call this function just to show that you can, you call workflows or tasks exactly the same way. 
um, it shows you that uh, all the basic units in flight have consistent interface. They're all strongly typed, um, and you can interact with them exactly the same way. Uh, last step here is the evaluate workflow. Um, and then last, the last section in the workflow is, uh, is the outputs. So you define outputs, again, strongly typed. Uh, there is like, a lot of emphasis on um, having uh, like the, and everything is typed. We always enforce the compatibility between tasks and between workflows uh, when it comes to types. Uh, and then you, you bind these outputs to specific outputs from uh, the prior steps. Uh, last thing I do here in the cell is uh, register the workflow, and let's do that. Uh, uh, since the registration is idempotent and the, each uh, spec is immutable, you can keep registering the same exact workflow over and over again. That does not result in creating new versions um, because they all exactly are the same. Um, then in this node, I do execute the uh, the, that workflow passing inputs here uh, to the workflow, and uh, it launched successfully, giving me the, uh, a, a unique identifier for this execution. Uh, at this point, this is when the control plane admin uh, that Kitten was talking about would create a CRD, a workflow CRD, in the corresponding or the chosen uh, Kubernetes cluster, um, and then things you know, really get started uh, to work. Um, I will run this cell and get back to it slightly later. Um, I will switch to the Flight UI to show you the execution while it's working. Uh, so this is the homepage of Flight, um, and it shows you a list of projects uh, well, uh, split by domains. Uh, and the domains are configurable in the system, uh, and they give you, um, uh, like, similar to CICD semantics for your own workflows. So you can move workflows that you are still working on it from development to staging as they uh, mature, and you get more confident in their executions. Um, for this demo, we registered two projects, uh, KubeCon demo and metrics. Just Make a mental note here about the metric project. We'll get back to it later. Um, the workflow we launched is in the demo project. So we'll open that up in development. Um, so opening any project will give you this list of uh, workflows that you have registered in the project. Uh, you have uh, descriptions, and you can search for them, uh, and the list of tasks. Uh, the workflow we registered is this orchestrator workflow, and it has been running. Um, you can see I launched that a ton of times just to make sure the demo works. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, you know, as we were talking, we, it already went through a few steps here. Um, and uh, that is because I kind of cheated. Uh, I leveraged the caching capability that Flight offers. So all of the tasks I have are marked as cached. So the, the very first time I ran this workflow, it took some time to run, but then every subsequent run uh, just takes a couple of minutes just to go through the existing uh, tasks and discover that they ran before because the inputs are the same and the, the task uh, signature hasn't changed, um, which you know, tells the system that the output should not have changed. Uh, it's another thing we, um, we strongly believe in that, that any code you write in a task or workflow should be repeatable. You shouldn't have any um, randomness or any, any irregularities or any dependencies on like global variables or things like that. Um, anything that affects the logic or the, the output of a task should be included as an input of a task. Um, this, the, the prepare workflow uh, ran these three tasks, but as I said, they're all discoverable. They haven't really done any work. Um, if we, I wanted to show you the, the workflow that I ran originally that actually did the work. And uh, you can see it uh, took an hour to run. Um, just to uh, show a few things here. Um, this, for example, this is a dynamic task. And uh, Kitten was talking about the, 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 it's one of the things that is supported by flight um, is dynamic nodes. So the dynamic nodes let you give you some flexibility or capability to uh, generate further graphs uh, based on maybe based on the inputs that it will discover 
during execution. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so one of the, the things, uh, the trend here is this array task, uh, size 50 or so, and uh, array tasks you can think of as like a map function uh, on a bunch of inputs, runs uh, massively parallel uh, tasks. Um, we, in, within flight, we run these on AWS. So um, great, uh, just to show that we run multiple different types of tasks. Uh, so going back to our uh, demo here, um, it's the, as I said, the workflow has finished already, and this task was just waiting for the workflow to finish and then download the model locally um, and uh, uh, unload it uh, because we, we used TensorFlow to train the model. Uh, it's a, we, we're loading it in Keras. Um, then we are going to run, oops, uh, the, oh, um, oh yeah, well, uh, sorry, that <laughs> isn't, uh... oh yeah, well, uh, yeah, so next uh, we are, uh, one of the things we ran in that workflow is this uh, confusion metrics uh, task that uh, looked that you know uh, evaluated the model and uh, output the, the confusion metrics. Uh, you can visualize that in uh, uh, in Jupyter or in any other system because again the outputs are described as protobufs. Um, all right. Um, okay. Sorry. When going back here, uh, just uh, just a quick recap of what we covered in the demo. Um, so. Flight is using a protobuf-based language, and that gives you uh, flexibility of building different kinds of SDKs, uh, different types of uh, you know, uh, target languages, uh, and very easily. Uh, the, the interface tasks and workflows have interfaces, and they are strongly typed. Uh, tasks are shareable, workflows are shareable and discoverable through the UI or APIs. Um, workflows are composable, we create the workflow of other workflows. Um, the tasks can be cached and executions are repeatable. Uh, I am, do not have time to go through the registration and execution process, but they are here. You can uh, go back to the slides. Um, just a quick, uh, we have a lot of extensibility points. As we said, we have some built-in plugins. Uh, pods, Spark, just to show CRDs uh, are an extensibility point. Uh, we have Kubel, service plugins, and you can build way more. Um, and uh, what is coming next, uh, we are, yeah, we, we covered that, a, a bit of that earlier, uh, but some of these are in design phases, phases and we are looking for uh, uh, your input on what, like how to prioritize this or contributions here. Uh, and uh, lastly, I want to thank everyone for attending. We know it's a very long day, uh, uh, but you made it. Um, you're almost there. The, the party is starting soon. Um, uh, please check out flight.org. Uh, we have docs and we have contributor docs too. Uh, so we are waiting for to see what every one of you will build. We'll be around in the whole way after this. If you have any questions, we'll happily answer them. Thank you. Yeah.